The heavy water reactor will use about 0.7% of the uranium's energy value, and the light water reactor will use about half of 1%. They both do terrible. You know, it's not like, yay, can do. You know, I mean, it's like we're just slightly less awful than you are. In addition to being a thorium guru, Weinberg was also the original inventor of the pressurized water reactor. He had invented it and gotten his patent for it in 1947. It was a little bit of a tricky thing to have the inventor of the light water reactor advocating for something very, very, very different. He figured there would be an accident someday, there could be a meltdown, there could be a release of radioactivity. We saw the failure of this at Fukushima Daiichi. You know, they had multiple backup diesel generators and each one probably had a very high probability of turning on at any given time. And they were there, several of them, so that if one didn't, the next one would. And if it didn't, the next one would. Well, the tsunami came and knocked them all out. You know, and that's what's called a common mode failure. And that's really hard to design to. At NASA, we were always thinking about how could we have a common mode failure that just trashes our idea of redundancy. Better than having what's called deterministic safety systems or engineered safety systems is to have inherent safety systems. One system that will work 100% of the time because it is not based on something turning on or off, it's based on the laws of physics. So this reactor has one safety system, the drain tank but it's always going to work because gravity's always gonna be turned on. This is the thing Weinberg was worried about in the mid 60s. And so he was trying to say, it would be a whole lot better if we got onto a reactor cycle that didn't involve high pressures and was really, really efficient with its fuel utilization. When this process was first discovered in 1942 by Glenn Seaborg, he said, this is a 50 quadrillion dollar discovery. He thought, we've just saved the world. We've just figured out how to make energy forever. And I think uh, Seaborg was actually pretty correct. They built a proof of principle reactor and it ran for about 11 days in 1954. As the salt would heat up, fission became less likely. Conversely, as the salt cooled down, there was more material because the salt was contracting and fission became more likely in an inherently stable system. In other words, gets hotter, cools down, gets too cool, heats up. You had an energy source that was utterly responsive to the demand that you put on it. Now think how amazing that is. Why do people say that nuclear energy is not green, that we don't have enough of it? And it's because if you look at the way we're doing nuclear energy now, just bring up that very, very small amount of uranium-235, that is not sustainable. If we tried to run the entire planet based only on the incredibly poor uh, energy consumption we get now, we would not be able to use conventional nuclear energy for hundreds of years. We would run out of fissile uranium-235. Uranium's not that uncommon. But uranium-235 is almost as rare as gold. I mean, imagine if we were burning gold for energy. And what Weinberg and Wigner and other guys figured out is don't burn the U-235, use it like a seed. Use it like a catalyst and burn cheap stuff like uranium-238 or thorium. That's how you make civilization run for thousands and thousands of years. But if you get off of that stage, if you get closer to that 100% fuel efficiency, especially with thorium, which is three times more common than uranium, then the whole story changes. There was a congressional leader named Chet Holofield who told Alvin Weinberg, if you're so concerned about the safety of nuclear energy, it might be time for you to leave the nuclear business. And Weinberg was horrified. He wasn't questioning the value or the importance of nuclear energy. If anything, he was far more convinced about that than anyone else. What he was questioning was had the right path been taken in the development of nuclear reactors. And he was particularly well suited to make that question because of his role as the inventor of the predominant technology. He was uh, quietly shown the door. After he left Oak Ridge, you can imagine that um, things did not go well for the research team that was working on thorium in the molten salt reactor. I found out a few months ago that the Chinese have decided to do this. People have been telling me for years, hey, Indians got a thorium program. And I said, yeah, yeah. It's based on the solid fuel thorium. You can't reprocess it every day like you need to with thorium. So I don't really think it's gonna do that good. Well, the thing that was really cool about the Chinese program was they were basing it on molten salts. And it's being run by a guy, and his father's name is Zhang Zemin. And he used to be the premier of China. And if he says he's going to go build a thorium molten salt reactor, well, I tend to think he's probably gonna do it. it would be a good idea if maybe we got going on this because uh, these guys are probably gonna pull it off. And you know, good, I hope they do. China definitely needs clean energy, absolutely. And thorium will provide them clean energy for hundreds of thousands of years. But frankly, I'd really like us to be able to do it too. And I'd like it to be something maybe that we developed rather than that we go buy. We buy a lot of things from China already. You know, I mean, it's not as if we're not buying enough things from China. 
thorium is always found with the rare earth elements. One of the reasons that we don't mine rare earth elements here in Canada and in the United States is because of the presence of thorium. If you currently mine rare earths in the United States, you have to treat the thorium that you would mine as a nuclear waste, which to me is a real head scratcher because I'm like, it was there in the earth. It's not like you made it or anything. All you did was you dug it up, you separated it, and all of a sudden you now have to dispose of it as nuclear waste. So I have a friend who's trying to start a rare earth mine in Missouri, and all he wants the government to do is to just let him put the thorium in barrels to not have to throw it away. He's not saying, I'm not even going to sell it yet. I'm just going to set it aside for future use. Jim, how much thorium do you think you'll be pulling up a year in your rare earth mine? He goes, I think about 5,000 tons. 5,000 tons of thorium would supply the planet with all of its energy for a year. I said, so your one mine in Missouri would bring up enough thorium without even trying to power the entire planet. He goes, yeah. And he goes, and there's like a zillion other places on Earth that are just like my mine. You know, there's nothing particularly, I mean, it's a nice mine, but it's not unique. It's not like this is the one place on Earth where this is found. I would really be surprised if our leadership knows about this. The fact that we have an internet today is going to ultimately make the difference. Every time mankind has been able to access a new source of energy, it has led to profound societal implications. You know, the industrial revolution and the ability to use chemical fuels was what finally did in slavery. Human beings have had slaves for thousands and thousands of years. And when we learned how to make carbon our slave, instead of other human beings, we started to learn how to be able to be civilized people. I really believe that if we don't have access to affordable and clean energy, we will revert. We will go back to the way humans have been for thousands and thousands of years, which is where the powerful and the rich oppress the masses who live terrible lives trying to provide things for just a few people. We live much better lives today because we have learned how to use carbon. Okay, what about thorium? Thorium has a million times the energy density of a carbon-hydrogen bond. What could that mean for human civilization going out thousands, tens of thousands of years into the future? Because we're not going to run out of this stuff. Once we've learned how to use it at this kind of efficiency, we will never run out. It is simply too common. Einstein was, I mean, not Einstein, trust me, but Einstein was one asked what it would take for other physicists to accept the theory of relativity, and he responded, well, the old people will have to die first, and then, uh, the young people who got used to it will come along and they'll accept it, which he's pretty much right. This is laws of physics stuff. I didn't invent it. All I do is promote it. Maybe I'll never see it happen in my life, but somebody will do it. Once people have learned how to do it, they'll keep using it because it will make that much difference to the uh, ultimate destiny of humanity. Thorium is a naturally occurring radioactive substance, not uncommon in the earth, about four times more common than uranium, found just about everywhere on this planet. And it has some unique properties. One of them is it is particularly well suited to being used in the class of nuclear reactors we have today, uh, what are called thermal spectrum reactors, reactors that have slowed down neutrons. And these reactors are a lot easier to control than what are called fast spectrum reactors, which have re neutrons that have not been slowed down. Almost all the reactors in the world today are thermal spectrum reactors. And thorium is particularly well suited to work in this environment. The reason why has to do with what thorium can become. Thorium by itself is not particularly interesting, but when you strike it with a neutron, it begins to undergo a metamorphosis, almost like a butterfly, into uranium-233. And it is uranium-233 that is particularly interesting. Uranium-233 is not like the other forms of uranium on Earth. Chemically, it's the same. But from a nuclear perspective, it has some superlative properties. One of which is, is when you hit it, you get two or three neutrons out. And one of them will continue the nuclear reaction, and the other one will convert another thorium into uranium-233. So you can continue the process of turning thorium into energy. Uranium-233 is almost like a little seed. And if you put it in the right kind of reactor and you run it the right way, you won't use it up. Or I should be, to be more specific, you will use it up at the same rate at which you make more of it. And that will allow you to, and I'm, if there are chemists in here, forgive me for what I'm about to say, but it'll allow you to catalyze the consumption of thorium. Now a true chemist will say, that's not really true. You're not really catalyzing, and I know I'm not. But it, it conveys the notion 
that this substance is, is maintained in a, a steady state. It isn't consumed in the reaction. And as we know, it really is, but it's also being regenerated. Well, this is a big deal because we have lots and lots of thorium. Thorium's not in any short supply. And so when this process was first discovered in 1942 by Glenn Seaborg at, uh, in Berkeley, California, he said to his uh, poor graduate student at the time, he said, this is a $50 quadrillion dollar discovery. He thought, you know, we've just saved the world. We've just figured out how to make energy forever. And I think uh, Seaborg was actually pretty correct in his initial assessment, even though that was a long, long time ago, that uh, this really is that big of a deal. Now, what's taken a long time has been for us to figure out how to really make this work. Uh, most of the progress was made before I was even born. One of Seaborg's colleagues in the Manhattan Project was a fellow named Eugene Wigner, who also went on to win the Nobel Prize. And Wigner was extremely excited about what Seaborg had figured out. He wanted to build reactors that ran on thorium in order to provide the energy for the world, and especially after the Manhattan Project wrapped up. Well, he had a young protege named Alvin Weinberg who had assisted him in their Manhattan Project activities. And he kind of, Alvin Weinberg later said in his biography that Wigner infected him with this notion. He got, he got the idea in his head that this was a, this was a really big deal for the world. Uh, Weinberg was offered a job running Oak Ridge National Labs in 1955. He was 35 years old. He was a year younger than I am right now, which is always sort of a high water mark for me. I was thinking, okay, when Weinberg was my age, he was running Oak Ridge National Labs, so what am I doing with my life? Wigner said, you should take this job because if you go to Oak Ridge, you can go and try to make thorium happen. And so that's what he did. He got there and he worked with some of the smartest engineers and chemists and scientists at the time about how do we turn thorium into a reality. And they began investigating some very, very radical nuclear reactors, totally different than the kind of stuff we have now. One of them was called, they called it the molten salt reactor. And it was based on the idea that you could take salts and that they would be a really good medium in which to have a nuclear reaction. Now, at first blush, you might say, well, why, why do a nuclear reaction in salts? Well, one of the reasons why, and again, if there are chemists in the room, forgive me, my chemistry understanding is, 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 uh, is cursory. Uh, salts being ionically bonded are very, very resistant to damage. And inside a nuclear reactor, uh, damage is going on a lot. You've got gamma rays flying around, you've got neutrons flying around. Normal matter gets really hashed inside a nuclear reactor. The nifty thing about a salt is that it can take this really, really severe punishment because it doesn't have to form tight bonds like a covalently bonded substance. It sort of more forms associations. Again, this is my simplified understanding of what an ionic bond is. And its properties don't change. So you could take a salt and you can put it in a reactor and pound it and pound it and pound it with neutrons and gamma rays, and it doesn't change in bulk chemical properties. So that was their first advantage. The other thing they really liked about the salt was that you had to heat it up to melt it, but once you had it melted, it had this enormous liquid range. It would be liquid for about 1,000 degrees. And that was a great medium in which to hold and transport heat. Contrast that with water. Water only has a liquid range of 100 degrees C. And so if we want to boost the liquid range of water, we have to put it under severe pressure. And that, in a nutshell, is, is what is, uh, is, is the challenge with our nuclear reactors today. Our water-cooled reactors, be they light water-cooled or heavy water-cooled, all deal with pressurized water. When you put water under extreme pressure, uh, like anything else, it wants to get out of that extreme pressure. And hot water at 300 Celsius and 150 atmospheres of pressure, if you release that, release that pressure, it's going to turn to steam. And so uh, dealing with pressurized water is a real challenge. So by using salt, you don't have to deal with high pressures. You can run these things at atmospheric pressure. And I just can't convey what a big deal that is because almost all of the aspects of our nuclear reactors today that we find the most challenging can be traced back to the need to have pressurized water, very pressurized water. Uh, so they were thinking along these lines and they, you know, everybody was saying, well, what a great idea. Is there any prayer that this might work? They didn't know, so they went and they built a proof of principle reactor. It was called the aircraft reactor experiment and it was very jury rigged, it was very put together. And it ran for about 11 days in 1954 and proved to them that essentially their notion was correct, that you could sustain nuclear fission reactions inside a salt, 
that it would operate at high temperature and low pressure, that it was very stable. And the reason why it was so stable was as the salt would heat up, there would be less fissile material in the nuclear reactor core, and so fission became less likely. Conversely, as the salt cooled down, there was more material because the salt was contracting, and fission became more likely. So what that, we call that in uh, engineering uh, an inherently stable system. In other words, gets hotter, cools down, gets too cool, heats up. So it wants to be right about where you want it to be. And this was a very big deal uh, in a nuclear reactor in any system because here it was, you had an energy source that was utterly responsive to the demand that you put on it. Now think how amazing that is. How many energy sources do we have that from a physics perspective can sense what it is you want from them they can sense a demand and they can respond automatically to that. Your car doesn't do that. You know, if you want to go faster in your car, you push on the accelerator and more gas goes into the engine and, and the reaction happens faster. The engine doesn't know that you want to go 60 miles an hour or anything like that. It has to be commanded. Almost everything, we have to increase the rate of a fuel or something else, increase the rate of a flow through a dam, or, and then you have other things like wind and solar where you can't change the rate of what's coming at all. You just take whatever you're going to get. So that is a, a really amazing quality that a nuclear reactor can have and this reactor had in spades. Well, having proven that this was essentially a sound idea, they got very excited and they wanted to uh, take it to the next level. They wanted to build an honest to goodness molten salt reactor. And Weinberg petitioned the Atomic Energy Commission in the United States for money and he got a little bit. He got enough to build a demonstration reactor. It was supposed to be less than 10 megawatts and they built it. It was called the Molten Salt Ex Reactor Experiment. It ran from 1965 to 1969 and it had the, the proper combination of salts in it. They had chosen a combination of lithium and beryllium fluoride as the base solvent for the reactor, and into that solvent they were going to dissolve uranium and thorium tetrafluorides. And this was the basis of how Weinberg and his people were going to, uh, were going to attempt to implement the thorium cycle in a reactor. So let me try to explain uh, th what I've got up here is a depiction of the liquid fluoride thorium reactor, which is kind of the modern incarnation of this design, but it's close enough to what they were doing. Actually, it is almost nearly exactly what they were doing in about 1967. The fuel salt in the reactor is a mixture of this lithium beryllium fluoride with uranium tetrafluoride, and this, the uranium in this case is uranium-233, which is formed from thorium. So the fuel salt enters the core and fission reactions take place and they're producing heat and that heat is deposited in the salt and the hot salt exits. About half of the neutrons are used in the core to continue the fission process and the other half of the neutrons are absorbed in this outer layer called a blanket. And the blanket contains also that lithium beryllium salt but now with, with thorium in it as well. So when the thorium absorbs the neutron, it turns into uranium and they had a chemical removal step here where they would go and they would expose some of this fertile salt to a fluorine gas stream. Now fluorine in this form will promote uranium from a tetrafluoride, that means it has four fluorides, to a hexafluoride, which means it has six fluorides. And there's kind of a neat thing about those two. Hexafluorides are gases and tetrafluorides are, are in solution. So here was a way to get what you wanted to come right out of the blanket as a gas. So uranium uh, hexafluoride, UF6, would come out of solution. Now thorium won't do this. Thorium only has a tetrafluoride. So you can sit there and pound it with fluorine all you want. It's not gonna come out of solution. So very, very slick trick to get what you want to happen without causing something you don't want to happen. So now what you need to do is you need to move this uranium hexafluoride into the fuel salt. So a stream of fuel salt would come into this column and now you pop it with a little bit of hydrogen gas and the hydrogen will go whoosh, whoosh, and it will pull two of those fluorines away from the uranium hexafluoride now taking it back down, reducing it back to the tetrafluoride, to number four. So now it's back in solution again. So what you've done is you've removed it from the blanket and you've fueled the core salt with it. So the core salt is in a continual state of being refueled with new uranium tetrafluoride from the blanket. The blanket is making it and the fuel salt is, is consuming it. So in steady state, these two processes are in balance. Now what comes out of the reduction column is hydrofluoric acid, HF. So you run that down to an electrolyzer 
and you can buy uh, HF electrolyzers. These are, these are uh, systems you can buy off the shelf. And it will run a little current through here and you'll get your reactants again. You'll get fluorine gas again and you get hydrogen gas. So you can continually recycle the reactants. The only input here is a little bit of electricity which you're going to make in the plant. So through this process, you can essentially implement that very simple thorium cycle in a reactor. And this is what Weinberg and his team were working on in the 1960s. The molten salt reactor experiment was meant to be the first part of it. They were just going to basically model the core. They were going to build a unit. They didn't have a blanket around it. They just wanted to see, can we get this first step to work? And they were successful. Now, after they completed the molten salt reactor experiment, they went to the Atomic Energy Commission. They said, hey, gee, can we have some more money? We'd like to go now and build the real thing. We'd like to build the core, and we'd like to build the blanket, and we'd like to hook a power conversion system on and make electricity. And they felt like they'd shot the moon. Well, the Atomic Energy Commission, unfortunately, did not uh, share their zeal to continue with the technology. They had invested very heavily in an alternative technology, uh, the plutonium fast breeder reactor. And this was based on using solid fuels and turning uh, abundant uranium-238 into plutonium-239 and then burning it in the reactor. It involved a whole different set of technologies that was much more in line with the light water reactors. It's funny, even at that time, 50 years ago, nobody thought the light water reactor or the heavy water reactor would be around very long. They were just simply too inefficient in their use of, of nuclear fuel. They use less than uh, the, the light water reactors. I actually do this as a, as a question for my students in my engineering class last semester. The heavy water reactor will use about 0.7% of the uranium's uh, energy value, and the light water reactor will use about half of 1%. So the heavy water reactor does a little bit better, but they both, they both do terrible. You know, it's not like, yay, can do, you know, I mean, it's like, we're just slightly less awful than you are, is all <laughs> you can say. But I know there's a lot of Canadians that are very proud of that slightly less awful step. So, you know, kudos to you guys. All right, now, sorry, I'm an engineer. If you're that far off 100%, man, I want to get a whole lot closer, you know, so, and, and Weinberg did too. They wanted to get uh, to nearly 100% of the energy utilization using either thorium or uranium. Well, like I was saying with the Atomic Energy Commission, they uh, said, hey, guess what? We're putting all this money in the fast breeder. We've got all these companies lined up to do the fast breeder. They'd even actually built one in Monroe, Michigan. It had had a meltdown, which wasn't good, but uh, <laughs> they were undeterred. They were moving forward, and so they told Weinberg to, to take a hike. Now, the story gets a little more complicated, too, because in addition to being a thorium guru, Weinberg was also the original inventor of the pressurized water reactor. He had invented it and gotten his patent for it in 1947. So it was a, a little bit of a tricky thing to have the inventor of the light water reactor advocating for something very, very, very different. And got a little worse than that too, see, because Weinberg never really was crazy about the light water reactor. He didn't like the fact that it had to run at really high pressure. He saw that as a, as a risk. He figured there would be an accident someday where you were not able to uh, maintain the pressure or keep cooling it. There could be a meltdown. There could be a release of radioactivity. Does any of this sound familiar? So, you know, this is the thing Weinberg was worried about in the mid-60s. And so he was trying to say, it would be a whole lot better if we got onto a reactor cycle that didn't involve high pressures and was really, really efficient with its fuel utilization. And he was making enough of a stink about this that there was a congressional leader named Chet Holofield who told Alvin Weinberg, he said, if you're so concerned about the safety of nuclear energy, it might be time for you to leave the nuclear business. And Weinberg was really kind of horrified that they would have this response to him because he wasn't questioning the value or the importance of nuclear energy. If anything, he was far more convinced about that than anyone else. What he was questioning whether was had the right path been taken in the development of nuclear reactors. And he was particularly well suited to make that question because of his role as the inventor of the predominant technology. So he was uh, quietly shown the door. After he left Oak Ridge, you can imagine that um, things did not go well for the research team that was working on thorium in the molten salt reactor. They had been deprived of their uh, powerful patron. And within a uh, very short order, the Atomic Energy Commission commissioned a report. It was called 
uh, Wash 1222, I like to call it Whitewash 1222 because they really nitpicked on three very, very, very small issues about the reactor. And they said, look, big problems here. You know, I don't think we can go forward until these are resolved. When it came time to talk about the safety and the performance of the reactor, I mean like one paragraph in the report about this. And it went something like, there may be some safety advantages that haven't been quantified yet regarding this approach, but you know, we just really can't be sure about that. So, and I just, just burns me up because I think big, big, big mistake the United States made in 1972 in, in walking away from this. So they put all their chips on the fast breeder reactor and that didn't work out too well for them. They started building one in Tennessee, right there at Oak Ridge. I kind of wonder, was this like a consolation prize to Oak Ridge? Were they trying to kind of buy them off for the fact that they had uh, shut down their, their molten salt program? And the program ended up getting canceled by Carter in 1979 and was briefly resurrected by Reagan in 1981 and then canceled again. So that's what happened to the fast breeder reactor in the United States. A couple other countries kept going with it. The French went with it in the 80s. They built Phoenix and Super Phoenix, and then they ended up shutting down their fast breeder too. And the Japanese tried it and they had several, but one called Manju, and it had been shut down since the mid 90s. And then a few months ago, they turned it back on again. And then somebody dropped a crane in the liquid sodium and then they shut it off again. And it's I don't know if they're ever turning that thing back on again. So, you know, everybody's tried the fast breeder reactor. I think the Russians are trying it. I have some good friends in the nuclear industry that are very big advocates of the fast breeder reactor. The, the common name for it now is the integral fast reactor. Uh, personally, you know, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of a reactor that's full of liquid sodium. Uh, if any, again, if any of you are chemists in here, you probably recall sodium has a great affinity for just about everything. So. You take liquid sodium and introduce it to anything and sparks fly, literally. So well, that's one of the things I like about salts. See, salts are already happy. You know, salts have, have met their destiny. You know, the, the cation has found the anion and they just live together in love forever, utterly uninterested in bonding or reacting with anything else. And from a nuclear perspective, that's a good thing. If you filled your reactor full of something, you don't want it to react with anything. You want it to be super happy. You want to just stay the way it is. And, and salts are great for that. So that's how things work on, on that side of the reactor. Well, let me close the fuel cycle for you here. So we're using up thorium in the blanket, right? Because we're converting it to uranium-233. So we better give the blanket a little feed of thorium tetrafluoride. And how much thorium do we need to run one of these things? Well, when you're converting thorium to energy with this kind of efficiency, the performance is pretty impressive. Uh, you can actually run a 1,000 megawatt plant for a year on about a ton of thorium, and, and that's not very much. To run that same plant on uranium, uh, well, there's a slight difference if you're doing heavy water versus light water, but it's about 200 to 250 tons of uranium required to make that same accomplishment. Now, the IFR guys would say, hey, we could do a lot better with IFR. Yeah, you could. They could do a lot better, but, but our reactors now are not are not very fuel efficient at all. In addition to being able to use the fuel more efficiently, you can also convert the heat generated in the fuel more efficiently to electricity. This is one of the really cool things about having fluoride salts. Like I said, they have that amazing high temperature range. They're great at carrying heat. They have about the same volumetric heat capacity as water. And, and that's really good. Water's really good at carrying heat volumetrically. The more heat you can carry per unit volume, the smaller your reactor can be. So that's a really important yardstick in how big your reactor is going to end up or not. You want to have a fluid that can carry lots and lots of heat, and uh, fluoride salts are really good at this. But unlike water, they have this amazing temperature range. They can go from 300 C to about 1600 C without changing phase. So you can run them at low pressure. Well, what you do is you pump that hot salt through a loop and you give up heat in a salt-salt heat exchanger to another salt. And this other salt is probably still the same stuff. It's probably still lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride. It just doesn't have any uranium or thorium in it. You use that same basic salt uh, combination. Now that coolant salt uh, is now going to give up heat to a gas in a gas turbine. Now all our reactors today use steam turbines. By using steam turbines, that's a kind of a good fit when you're using water as a coolant, but a steam turbine is limited how efficient it can be. It can only typically convert 33% to 40% of its heat to electricity. Uh, gas turbine, on the other hand, it has a much higher potential temperature range. Now, I don't want to make the blanket statement that gas turbines are more efficient than steam turbines because a thermodynamicist would say, no, 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 you can't really say that. I will say that 
uh, gas turbine is capable of going to the higher temperatures needed to achieve higher efficiency. So by using a gas turbine, we can get about 50% more electricity out of each unit of heat produced in the reactor than a steam turbine can. And there's another great effect with a gas turbine. Uh, so here's the electricity being made off the turbine. When the gas is cooled, if we're near a, a coastal region, we can use that waste heat that would otherwise be thrown away to desalinate seawater. After energy, fresh water is probably one of our greatest challenges going forward in future development. You know, I've often seen programs on television talking about you know, how are we going to manage the water crisis that will be the bigger crisis in this century than the energy crisis. And I think we can manage them at the same time if you have a, an efficient source of heat. So you can do that. Another thing you can do, you, if you didn't do this, is you can actually reject the heat to air uh, without going too much into thermodynamics. That's a lot more of a favorable process in a gas turbine than it is in a steam turbine. You know, I was flying the, in a plane powered by two gas turbines all the way here. Now, they were burning fuel to do it. You know, we're going to provide our heat from hot salt. But these technologies, you know, they basically come out of the aerospace industry. And if we were able to reject heat to air, now all of a sudden you don't have to put a reactor next to a body of water or next to a river. I was looking at this map of the United States and it showed where all the reactors were. And you could almost correlate each one exactly to a river or a body of water. Now I'm from Utah originally. It's pretty high and dry in Utah. You know, we don't have a lot of extra water going around. And, and of course there's no reactors there. So uh, being able to have a reactor that could be independent of a, of a water cooling supply is a really good thing. That is what uh, would enable a liquid fluoride thorium reactor to have many hundreds of times the fuel efficiency of today's water-cooled reactors and also a significantly higher thermodynamic efficiency than the, than the steam turbines we use today. When I learned about this stuff, I became very excited because, you know, engineers love efficiency. It's just in our blood. I always tell my wife, you know, what is the central organizing principle of the engineer's mind? And she's learned to say, efficiency. I said, yes, efficiency. And, she, and whenever she wants to impress me, she goes, I want you to know how efficiently I accomplished something today. And she'll tell me, and I go, oh, oh, you said the magic word. I just love it when things are efficient. We also hate it when things are inefficient. You know, I mean, that's just, the engineer looks at the world as, as a, as a sort of, uh, hundreds of things that are, that are inefficient and, and should be more properly designed, you know. So, so when you tell an engineer that something's like 20% more efficient, it's like, yeah. You tell them it's like 50% more efficient, like, oh my gosh. Now imagine when you tell them it's, hundreds of times more efficient. It becomes absolutely irresistible, which is what happened to me. I learned about this and I wanted it really bad to happen. So uh, this is about 10 years ago. I got in the car. I live in Alabama and I was able to go up to Oak Ridge and then talk to some of the people there. And I said, hey, I've heard that you guys a long time ago did this really, really cool thing. Uh, what's going on? And they're like, yeah. Long time ago, we did a really, really cool thing, and everybody who did it's retired or dead now. I'm like, oh, well, that's not good. What can we do? And they said, well, they wrote a lot of papers, and they wrote a lot of reports. I said, oh, okay, can I get them? Oh, yeah, they took me to this file cabinet, and it was, like, full of stuff. I said, huh, you know, I'm kind of one of these children of the digital age. Can we get it on a CD or something? And they said, oh, that'll cost money. So I went back to NASA, and... and uh, Talked to some of my friends and told them, hey, this would be great for a space reactor. We ought to throw some money at these guys and get all this stuff uh, documented. And they said, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. So we got a little bit of money up to Oak Ridge, about $10,000, and they went and PDF'd. Not everything, but most of it, about two-thirds of it. So I had this stack of CDs, and I thought, oh, sent a copy to the Secretary of Energy, sent a copy to the Director of National Labs, sent it all out to these different places, just sure that, you know, they were going to get CDs from a random person and put them in their computer and study them extensively, all five gigabytes of them, and come to the same conclusion I had and change national policy. I mean, of course, right? Didn't really work out that way. Uh, so after about five years of this, I, you know, I thought, well, maybe there's something else I could do. And I heard of people doing blogs. I want to write an important blog. I want to write a blog about, you know, what we should have done with our energy policy. So I started this blog and I called it Energy from Thorium and you know nobody read it for a long time and then I kept writing on it and then a few people started reading it and we started kind of talking about it and it got more and more fun and chewed up more and more of my free time that I had less and less of as I had more and more children. Cool things have happened since then. Uh, we've made a lot of new friends online and some of them have gotten really excited about it too. Uh, 
One guy in particular, John Cooch, he decided to go and uh, start a nonprofit called the Thorium Energy Alliance, which was an excuse for us all to have fun conferences. You know, our first conference had about 30 people at it. We had our second conference last year about this time at Google, and that was a lot better. About 100 people came, and we're going to have our third conference in Washington, D.C., and hopefully we'll have even greater representation by Verisex. 55% of the voting public is female. If we do not get this message out to everyone, then nothing's going to change. And so I felt very strongly that we need to talk more and more about this. And, and I've been lucky uh, in my job and in my free time to, to be able to share this message more. I've been very fortunate to get invitations like this to come and talk to people like you. And what, what should we talk about now? I want to say any questions. What should we talk about now? What should we talk about? So where are you going? I want to build one. So after years and years and years of trying to talk the U.S. government, or any government for that matter, into going for it, I found out a few months ago that the Chinese have decided to do this. Now, people have been telling me for years, hey, Indians got a thorium program. And I said, yeah, yeah, but I always look into it, and it's based on the solid fuel thorium. It's not very promising. You can't recycle solid fuel. You can't reprocess it every day like you need to with thorium. So I don't really think it's going to do that good. Well, the thing that was really cool about the Chinese program was they were basing it on molten salts. And it's being run by a guy named Zhang Ming Heng. He got his PhD in electrical engineering from Drexel University, he was educated in the United States. The really interesting thing about Mr. Zhang, or Dr. Zhang, I should say, is that his father's name is Zhang Zemin, and he used to be the premier of China. So when I found that out, I thought, okay, this is not some schmo here. This is somebody who's probably got some resources behind him. And if he says he's going to go build a thorium molten salt reactor, well, I tend to think he's probably going to do it. So ever since finding that out, I've been uh, really encouraging uh, uh, people in the United States and England and Canada and Japan and just about anywhere. I said, you know, it really would be a good idea if maybe we got going on this because uh, these guys are probably going to pull it off. And, you know, good. I hope they do. China definitely needs clean energy. Absolutely. And thorium will provide them clean energy for hundreds of thousands of years. But frankly, I'd really like us to be able to do it too. And I'd like it to be something maybe that we developed rather than that we go buy. We buy a lot of things from China already. You know, I mean, it's not as if we're not buying enough things from China. We are definitely keeping them busy. So let, you know, let's, let's go develop thorium. And uh, that's really what I'd like to do. Question on thorium. Uh, comments on the use of can do using thorium for the can there have been experiments that Atomic Energy of Canada have done with the Chinese because the fuel, the flexible fuel cycle in the can do as compared to a light water reactor. Any thoughts on the use of thorium as a fuel in an existing reactor? Let me talk a little bit about thorium in a can-do. Now, I may be oversimplifying it, but the really cool thing about a can-do is you go ahead and you put it heavy. Does anybody ever know what heavy water is? Normal light water has uh, hydrogen, regular hydrogen that just has one proton. Uh, really geeky guys like me would call that protium. There's another isotope of hydrogen called deuterium, very rare, whereas a proton and a neutron. The cool thing about deuterium is it doesn't want to eat another neutron. Protium has a fairly healthy appetite to eat another neutron and become deuterium. But deuterium's like, dude, I'm happy. Don't give me any more, I'm full. So when you build a reactor and you put in deuterium in the form of water that has instead of H2O, it has two deuteriums instead of two regular hydrogens, that water has an extremely low propensity to absorb neutrons. So the cool thing about can -dos is that you can actually fuel them on natural uranium. You don't have to enrich uranium. In the United States, we use light water reactors, we use regular water, and because we do that, and that regular water wants to eat neutrons, we have to enrich the fuel. We have to increase its fraction of uranium-235 from where it is in nature, which is less than 1%, about 0.7%. We enrich it to like 3 or 4%. So if you go and you try to use thorium in a can-do, well, right off the bat, you're not using natural uranium anymore. So you have to mix the thorium with some type of fissile material. Maybe it's uranium-235, maybe it's plutonium, maybe it's uranium-233. But in my mind, it kind of negates one of the basic economic advantages of the can-do, which is the ability to use natural uranium. As I mentioned before, can-dos get better overall fuel utilization than light water reactors do. They can use about 0.7% of natural uranium. It's energy. Uh, light water reactors only use half of 1%. But if you want to use thorium in that, you've kind of got to go ahead and either enrich U-235 or you've got to have a reprocessing system where you're extracting 
plutonium from spent nuclear fuel. So I kind of don't really see where the, uh, the, the, the program is going if you want to use, is it possible? Absolutely. Is it economically advantageous? I don't think so because the basic economic advantage that it can do is the ability to use natural uranium. That's, that's the situation now. Uh, the reason the Chinese and the Indians are putting R&D into thorium is because they don't have uranium in either of the two countries. Mm -hmm. How uh, the thorium reaction separates uranium was uh, as far as waste Okay, very good question. How do you thorium, and when you say thorium reactors, I'm going to interpret that as liquid fluoride thorium reactors, you know, because you could use thorium in a can do, or a light water reactor, or a bunch of things. Okay, so how do lifters with their thorium use compare to the waste situation in a light water reactor or a can do? Both light water reactors and can do's do not use very much of the energy in the fuel, and they leave behind uh, two classes of materials. One is the actual fission products. That's what happens when you fission the stuff. And then there is what's called the transuranics. That's what happens when the uranium absorbs the neutron and doesn't fission. It turns into plutonium and americium and curium and a few others. Most of it's plutonium. I mean, the overwhelming majority of transuranics are plutonium. So when you talk to people about waste disposal, they say, you know, what's the concern? Well, most of the stuff that's in the fuel is just uranium. It's no more radioactive than it was when you stuck it in. And it's not really a concern. And the fission products, they are very radioactive uh, when they're created, but they decay rather quickly. They don't really have long-term radioactivity. They just decay too fast is, is the deal. There are a few of them that have very long half-lives, but that means their radioactivity levels are extremely low and they just don't really pose a hazard. The real challenge with spent fuel management is the presence of those transuranics, plutonium, americium, curium, because they have moderate half-lives and they have complicated decay chains. When you're looking at like a Yucca Mountain or a disposal site, you go, what are we gonna do with that? Well, the basic advantage of Lifter over that approach is we don't form those transuranics. We burn up essentially all of the fuel in this process because we don't remove fuel from the reactor. There we go. Until it's a fission product. Let me show you what I mean over here. Uh, occasionally you reprocess the core. You take all the uranium and you remove it by fluorination and you return it there. Here are some classes of fission products and they can be partitioned and split up. But the general idea is you don't want uranium or thorium or anything else to end up in your waste stream. And that's a pretty straightforward proposition in this fluid fueled reactor. So our waste story is a lot different. There's a lot less of it and it's a different type and it's much more amenable to partitioning. How is it different from a uranium breeder reactor? Uh, the uranium breeder reactor, if it can also retain actinides in the core without rejecting to the waste stream, it's almost the same. But with, like for instance, the integral fast reactor, there's a fraction, every time you reprocess solid fuel, you lose a fraction of whatever it is you're trying to do. Uh, depending on who you ask, what that number is. Um, I've heard from people that I tend to believe who worked on the program, that could be as high as 3%. When you're recycling every six months, that adds up really quickly. So you're ending up rejecting stuff to your waste stream that you would really rather not reject. It's all about how precisely you can recycle the fuel. Batch reprocessing, dissolution of fuel and reconstitution of fuel is not very good at achieving high separation factors. Processes like these are a whole lot better at that. You can fluorinate extremely efficiently, like several nines of, of efficiency. So by keeping actinides in the reactor and not in the waste stream, you change the entire waste story significantly. You can also then turn around and go back and take some of the waste that's already been created in our uranium fueled reactors and potentially destroy those long-lived transuranics through fission. You know, waiting them out to decay is a very slow process. Plutonium-239, for instance, has a 24,000 year half-life. So that's a long time you're gonna be waiting for that to decay. On the other hand, you can fission it and then those fission products will decay very rapidly and you also get an energy release and a neutron release, which is both of which are good. So very, very different approach to waste, making less of it, moving towards stability much more quickly, and also is in a form that is much more amenable to be partitioned and separated. From waste to fuel, I've heard that uh, nuclear energy is not a good alternative energy for the world to take on to combat greenhouse gases because we use up all the available uranium. I don't know if that's true or not. I've heard that. Well, I guess depending on your theological perspective, I think thorium comes from God, but you know. <laughs> uh, to be really precise, thorium was created in a supernova along with just about everything else, probably somewhere on the order of five billion years ago. Where would I find someone? 
everywhere. You know, get a Geiger counter and you'll find out how fast you'll find it really quick. Can you mine it or? Yes, you can mine it. I don't think that will be necessary because we have a real appetite right now for rare earth materials. You know, there's a whole category of these rare earths. So if you remember your periodic table, the lanthanides that call them above the actinides, those are all the rare earths. All kinds of things that we do with these rare earths. Hey, you guys, you guys, anybody, anybody got little uh, earphones right now? Anybody had their earphones in their ears while I've been talking to try to drown me out? Half the class can lay their hands on those little bitty earphones. Older folks like me will recall a day when earphones didn't look like that. It was more like, like this, there were these big things that went over our ears. The whole trick to that has been the invention of a little magnet based on neodymium, neodymium iron boron magnets. Extremely powerful magnets and they use a rare earth mineral called neodymium. So naturally, global demand for neodymium has gone And because neodymium iron boron magnets are so powerful, one of the places they find application is in the generators that sit on top of windmills. Because if you're gonna put a generator on a windmill, on this really, really high stock, you want it to be as lightweight as possible. And there's no better way to do that than to use neodymium iron boron magnets. So global demand for wind has really increased desire to find neodymium. Currently, it's all being mined in China. Now, why am I talking about neodymium? Well, because thorium is always found with the rare earth elements. So one of the reasons that we don't mine rare earth elements here in Canada and in the United States is because of the presence of thorium. If you currently mine rare earths in the United States, you have to treat the thorium that you would mine as a nuclear waste, which to me is a real head scratcher because I'm like, it was there in the earth. It's not like you made it or anything. All you did was you dug it up, you separated it, and all of a sudden you now have to dispose of it as nuclear waste. So I have a friend who's trying to start a rare earth mine in Missouri, and all he wants the government to do is to just let him put the thorium in barrels to not have to throw it away. He's not saying, I'm not even gonna sell it yet. I'm just gonna set it aside for future use. And if he is able to get some changes in legislation, he'll be able to do that. So what this comes around to is we don't even need to try to mine for thorium. If we open even one rare earth mine, we'll be pulling so much of this stuff up. So I asked him, Jim, how much thorium do you think you'll be pulling up a year in your rare earth mine? He goes, I think about 5,000 tons. He goes, is that a lot? I said, well, by my calculations, 5,000 tons of thorium would supply the planet with all of its energy for a year. I said, so your one mine in Missouri would bring up enough thorium without even trying to power the entire planet. He goes, yeah, and he goes, and there's like a zillion other places on Earth that are just like my mine. You know, there's nothing particularly, I mean, it's a nice mine, but it's not unique. It's not like this is the one place on Earth where this is found. If that's not good, uh, about 50 years ago, back when Weinberg and Wigner were still getting listened to, they convinced the U.S. government to go and stockpile some thorium. They said, hey, this is good stuff. You're going to need it in the future. It needs to be part of your strategic reserve. So they did. They got 3,200 tons of it, and they had it in barrels, and they had it in these two uh, depots. I think one was in Maryland, one was in Indiana, and they had it for years and years and years. About five years ago, somebody wanted to close the depot, and they said, well, what do we do with all this thorium? Does anybody want it? At that time, I was like, yeah, I want it. I want it. But nobody would listen to me because I was just a schmo. I mean, I guess I still am a schmo. So they took it out to Nevada and they buried it under about 12 feet of dirt. So even before you need to go find my friend and his rare earth mine, you can go out to Nevada and dig down about 12 feet and in nice tractor trailer containers, which I found out were brand new, they bought the tractor trailer containers just for this, open the doors and there's barrel after barrel of thorium nitrate, about 3,200 tons, which would provide about two thirds of the planet's energy needs for a year. If that's not good enough for you either, the Chinese, who apparently have had a more far-sighted approach to thorium for quite some time than we have, I have been told, have been stockpiling it for years as they mine for rare. Since 99% of the rarest that we use, including those, those, those magnets, they're from China. And you're like, so what? Everything's from China. Well, when those got mined, there was probably some thorium that came up with it that's probably sitting in some barrels over in China right now, waiting for Dr. Zhang to finish his experiments with thorium molten salt reactors and to start putting it to use. It's not going to be too hard to find this stuff. It's, it's, it's just not rare. Is the natural thorium we mine 231? Good question. Is the natural thorium we mine a particular isotope? Yes, it is. It is thorium-232. It is, even though there are a number of thorium isotopes, there's only one that's found in nature. So it's monoisotopic. So it comes up the way we want it. 
The half-life of thorium-232 is 14 billion years. So when the universe is twice as old as it is now, half that thorium will still be here. Now, one of the things I had to get my brain wrapped around, and I'm gonna use this as an excuse to talk about something, is that um, I used to have this idea that if something had a short half-life, then it was you know putting out radiation for a little while, and then it stopped. And if something had a long half-life, that it was putting out radiation for a while, and then it stopped after a much longer period of time. That's absolutely incorrect. That's not the way it works at all. If something has a short half-life, it means it's really, really radioactive. If something has a really long half-life, it means it's hardly radioactive at all. Mathematically, it's exactly the definition of radioactivity. It correlates precisely to half-life. So if somebody says, would you like something that has a half-life of a day, or would you like something that has a half-life of 100,000 years? Most people probably go, I'll take the day. That's the wrong answer, dude. <laughs> the 100,000 year thing, don't worry, you can hold it in your hand. Nobody's gonna get in any trouble. The day thing, that'll kill you. Important safety tip, remember that. So when people are talking about iodine-131 and the media is saying, oh, don't worry, it's got an eight-day half-life. Well, you should go, oh, eight-day half-life. Um, that means it's pretty radioactive, and it is. It's, it's quite a bit more dangerous than things that have long half-lives. But it's got an eight-day half-life. The reactors aren't making any more of it. When they got shut down the day the earthquake happened, they stopped making this stuff. So it's gone. In about a month, all the iodine-131 from Fukushima Daiichi will be gone. There is no natural iodine-131 because of that. So it's very easy to find. If you find any of it, you go, oh, something happened. You know, I mean, it's a trigger right there to tell you this has come from Japan because it just would not be around otherwise. But it doesn't mean it's insufficient amounts to, to pose a hazard. It could be argued that the Japanese situation resulted from a loss of electricity at the reactor. What would happen with a molten salt reactor if you had a loss of electricity? Thank you for asking that question. I, I'm kicking myself that that was not part of my presentation. What happened at Fukushima Daiichi was based on a loss of power. And, and it's correct, if, if we had had the power to continue to run the pumps, that design was intended so that you could continue to remove heat from the core indefinitely. That was the point of the torus and, and the suppression pond and everything else. What happened was we didn't have the power and so uh, things got bad within within a few days and it simply was not what it was designed to do a lot of nuclear engineers would say hey you know that's just how it is with with water-cooled reactors with liquid fluoride reactors on the other hand you have a lot more options and one of them is the ability to design a cooling system that is completely passive that does not rely at all on electrical power to manage the decay heat after shutdown and the way they did this on the molten salt reactor experiment was they had this little thing called a freeze plug. It sat in the bottom of the reactor. It was a little port in the bottom of the, of the reactor and they had a, a pipe that ran out of this port. And to keep the port plugged, they had a blower that would blow cool gas over it. So there was a little plug of frozen salt there. Well, if the power went out, the blower turned off and the heat would melt the frozen plug and guess what? Psh, everything would drain out of the reactor into this tank called a drain tank. And the drain tank was configured completely differently than the reactor. It was configured to maximize the removal of heat. And I'm a mechanical engineer, so all we ever talked about in school was how to you know, add heat to things and take heat out of things. And one of the hard things about designing a nuclear reactor is designing it to not lose any heat while you're running it, because you don't want all that heat to go over to the steam turbine. You don't want to lose a bunch of heat in normal operation, but then to turn around and try to keep it cool if something goes wrong. So there are two conflicting things. The great thing about uh, liquid fluoride reactors is you can design them completely separately. You can say, here's my reactor and it's designed to make heat, and here's my drain tank, and it's designed to cool in all situations. So that's what you can do. And they demonstrated this on MSRE. Uh, when they want to turn off the reactor, they just turn off the power to the blower. Salt would drain into the tank, and after a couple of days it would freeze. And then when they wanted to turn it back on again, they would put some electrical, they had some uh, electrical uh, heaters on the drain tank, they'd turn them on, they'd thaw the tank, and they'd pump the salt back up into the reactor. So it was an incredibly passive approach to, uh, to doing this. Another great thing about it, because it was not operating at high pressure, this is a system that was tolerant of extraordinary damage. I mean, if you wanted to go in and jam a projectile through the side of the reactor, the salt would still just drain out now into a pan, but the pan would run back into the drain tank. So this was a reactor that could take a great deal of abuse. Now in that situation, you're not going to turn the thing right back on again, but it's not going to uh, lead to a, uh, a dangerous release of radioactivity. Because the salts 
do not hold in gaseous fission products. They have a system that completely deals with that. And then it is very good at holding some of the more dangerous fission products. Uh, strontium and cesium are both bound up in very, very stable fluoride salts. Cesium fluoride, very stable salt. Uh, strontium bifluoride, another very stable salt. In light water reactors, cesium is volatile in the, in the chemical state of the uh, oxide fuel of a light water reactor. And that's been one of the concerns about cesium release. Cesium would not release from a, a fluoride reactor at all. So the safety situation is, is really compelling. Now you can you know, be a bad engineer and design a bad reactor, but the options are there to do a really, really great job on safety because of low pressure and a completely passive approach to, to decay heat removal. If it's as safe as it sounds, what's preventing the North American governments from actually creating a salt reactor? What's, what's the scary thing about it? Ah, you're thinking like me 10 years ago. You're looking for a, a, a reason why not. I don't think there is a reason why not. There may be a reason why they may not be excited to do it, but there's no reason why they can't do it. Water-cooled reactors based on solid uranium fuel, that's this whole thing of technology. So then you come along and say, I want to build a, a liquid fluoride thorium reactor using thorium and liquid fuel and a gas turbine. And they go, okay, what does this have in common with this? And they look at all their technologies and everything they're selling and they go, they have nothing in common. So you got to say, okay, if I'm a company that's building can do's or light water reactors or anything, what competitive advantage do I have by pursuing this other direction? Probably don't have any. I mean, this is why I think that the, this will be developed by a new company. I think it'll be developed by a company that, that is not building reactors today. It's, it's something completely different. How scalable are they? Like, you know, our current nuclear plants are quite large. Is this, can this be more important? How scalable is it? it? It is much more amenable to being scaled because of the presence of that blanket. The blanket is really the real trick to scaling it. When you take normal reactors today and you try to scale them down, uh, as they have more surface area to volume, a lot more of the neutrons will leak out. And you'll get to a point where neutron leakage is a dominant term of losing neutrons. Okay, most of our reactors today don't have blankets. On the other hand, in this reactor, you essentially design it to be half leaky by intention. You want the core to leak about half of its neutrons into the blanket. So as long as the blanket is, is a certain depth, of, of uh, neutron penetration, then that's fine. So the blanket allows the reactor to be far more scalable and w without a severe loss of efficiency like what would happen in a, in a reactor without design. Now it is possible to take solid fuel reactors and design them with what's called a zoned core. Some companies look at this called sometimes a seed and blanket where you have your fuel regions and then you surround that with a periphery of absorber regions. But those are generally when you're trying to actually try to breed new fuel. We don't really try to do that in can do's and light water reactors, but you can. Even in light water reactors, as certain fuel elements will begin to burn down, they'll move them more out to the periphery and they act a little bit like a blanket, but there's still a, a significant amount of neutron loss. So by having the blanket, you have the ability to scale the reactor up and down in size much more uh, without, without a si significant loss of either thermodynamic or neutronic efficiency. You said the efficiency for current nuclear reactors is 0.5, 0.7%. What's the efficiency that the guys got at Oak Ridge? They did not ever get to build their, their reactor that had the thorium blanket. But they were anticipating, based on this chemical approach, that they could, that they could approach very, very close to 100% conversion efficiency. I mean, it really got to a point where it was like, you know, how close do you want to get? How much do you want to pay for that? You know, do you want to put another nine on that was, was really the only question. And there may be an economic argument in there, but you're going from less than 1% to probably mid to high 90s of conversion efficiency. What's the cost of building a reactor that won't be solved compared to what we have? Yes, what's the cost of doing it this way? I anticipate that most of the costs of developing this are going to be in the development stage. You know, light water reactors can do, the, essentially the technology has been developed. This has to have a, a technology development step and that will probably run in the hundreds of millions, maybe even in the billions of dollars to get through the development step. Now, in, in aerospace engineering, we were taught to put 
development cost and unit cost in separate categories. You know, it's like you build a fighter and you spend billions of dollars to design it, but then you run off copies for $20 million a piece. You know, that's how they build like 737s or other airplanes. If you want to go, well, what's the unit cost going to be? There's reasons to think this is going to be a lot less expensive than what we have today if we set the development in, a, in another column. And the reason why, number one, low pressure operation. That's the biggest one. When you don't have to have nine inch thick steel pressure vessels, huge concrete containments. Number two, you don't have to fabricate fuel. You don't have to enrich it, you don't have to fabricate it, and you don't have to have the approach disposal that we have today. So those two features right away are a big deal. But number three is the safety systems. High pressure water cooled reactors have an abundance of safety systems designed to always keep the core covered with water. So if one system has 99% reliability, well you need another one that also has it so that you can get 99.99 and you know maybe statisticians will get mad at me, I might be doing it wrong. But we saw the failure of this at Fukushima Daiichi. You know, they had multiple backup diesel generators, and each one probably had a very high probability of turning on at any given time. And they were there, several of them, so that if one didn't, the next one would, and if it didn't, the next one would. Well, the tsunami came and knocked them all out. You know, and that's what's called a common mode failure. And that's really hard to design to. At NASA, we were always thinking about how could we have a common mode failure that just trashes our idea of redundancy better than having what's called deterministic safety systems or engineered safety systems is to have inherent safety systems. One system that will work 100% of the time because it is not based on something turning on or off, it's based on the laws of physics. So this reactor has one safety system, the drain tank, but it's always going to work because gravity is always going to be turned on. Now if we were in space, we might have to re revisit that, but here on the earth, uh, as long as things fall down, that system will work. And as I explained before, it even works under situations of severe damage. Why wouldn't they run it so the electricity they generate from the pumps that they need to cool the place? Because clearly something went wrong there. In the reactor, are they not able to shut down the uh, reaction enough that the core won't? Uh, no, no. Good. I have to take both those questions simultaneously because they both are related to the same answer. Okay, the first question was, why don't they run it to provide electricity to run the pumps? And the second one was, can't they control the fission reaction enough to uh, prevent it from having a meltdown? It is actually very easy to turn off the fission reaction. When the reactors at Fukushima Daiichi, there were seismic sensors in the plant that noticed the earthquake before any human being ever noticed it. And they noticed that it was out of their tolerance or their bounds that they'd been set to. And so before anybody did anything, the computers started shutting down the reactors. And what they did was they pushed these fuel rods up into the core. And the fuel rods were absorbing the neutrons and the reactor became subcritical. So every three minutes the power was dropping by a factor of 10. Okay, so within three minutes after those rods went in, the power had dropped from 100% to 10%. Three minutes later, it dropped to 1%. And the reason it's significant is, is after it drops past about 5%, you don't have to worry about fission heat anymore because fission is not the dominant energy generating term. Now, every time fission has happened, you've generated two fission products. And they're very radioactive, and they are still decaying. Decay has absolutely nothing at all to do with fission. Now, now fission, of course, is what created the materials that are indicating, but you can't turn decay on and off. If we can turn new radioactive decay on and off, we could do all kinds of things, but we've never figured out how to do it. I don't think we ever will because we simply can't influence the state of the nucleus like that. So when you turn a reactor off, fission stops, but you have this decay heat and the decay heat drops rapidly, but it's about 5% of the rate of power right at shutdown and then it drops exponentially from there. Within about an hour, I think it's dropped down to about 2%. Within about eight hours, it's dropped down to like 1%. Within a day, it's at about half a percent but you have to manage that decay heat. Now one of the good things that happened at Fukushima Daiichi, the tsunami hit about an hour after the reactors were shut down. So fission was long gone by the time the tsunami came along, but the reactors were still managing decay heat. The tsunami came and destroyed the diesel generators, but they still had batteries. And those batteries ran for about eight hours. That eight hours was the most important time of all because that was when the decay heat was, it was, it was dropping very rapidly, but if you had to pick eight hours to make sure that the pumps were still working, those first eight hours were the most important time. So by the time the batteries ran dry and the pumps stopped, the reactor had gotten past the worst part of its decay heat come down. But 
it was still going on. Right. Decay heat doesn't turn off, and it, and it continues even in spent fuel. So over time, that decay heat continued to build. Heat was not being removed from the reactor. And to go back to your first question, why weren't they using the power from the reactor to run the pumps? Because the reactor had been turned off immediately when the seismic sensors sensed the quake. So there was no reactor-generated power. Now maybe if we'd known then what we know now, which was that the reactors were going to survive the earthquake, and they did, it might have been a better idea to leave the reactors running than to turn them off. If we had left them running, they would have been able to generate power, which could then have run the pumps, and none of this bad stuff would have happened because you would have had continuous removal of heat from the reactor. It was that loss of power that was so troubling. Okay, so we're using chlorine in all the compounds, or if we were using something else, like would chlorine have the same sort of thing, iodine, bromine, would that have the same energy output? Why use fluorine as the halogen rather than chlorine or iodine or bromine? Several reasons for that. One is fluorine has an extremely low absorption for neutrons. It doesn't want to absorb a neutron. In fact, of those, of those elements, it's the best. Another one is fluorine is monoisotopic. It's all fluorine 19. So you don't have to worry about one being better than the other. For instance, chlorine has two naturally occurring isotopes, chlorine 35 and 37. And 35 is a lot more absorptive than 37. So if you were going to use chlorine, you would need to go through an isotopic separation, get the 37 instead of the 35. Uh, I believe iodine is, iodine is also monoisotopic, but iodine is, is far enough down the list that it doesn't form really, really strongly ionic bonds with these things. In those cases, other chemical forms are favored, like oxides. Fluorine is the most electronegative element on the periodic table. It will bond with things that other things won't bond with. You can make xenon molecules with fluorine. That's how well it bonds. Xenon normally doesn't bond with anything because it's a noble gas, but fluorine is extremely electronegative, and so it forms very, very strong ionic bonds. And that is the basic reason why fluorine is the, the chemical element you want to use in these reactor designs. I'm amazed, you know, we just got lucky that we live in a universe where, where fluorine has such a low neutron absorption cross-section. If fluorine had a big neutron absorption cross-section, we couldn't build fluoride reactors. It'd be impossible. So, you know, yay. <laughs> you talked a little bit about how the American government feels about this. Or at least how they did in 1969. Right, and how they haven't really changed their minds since then in spite of how good of an idea it seemed. I don't know if they know about it, to be brutally honest. I mean, I would really be surprised if our leadership knows about this. I, I don't think they read the blog. I don't think they read blogs. At least mine. I'm trying to raise the profile and get more attention. Yeah. How successful do you feel like that's going in Canada? You know, our regulators tend to argue amongst each other all the time instead of paying attention to anybody else. Yeah, we don't have that problem in America. No. Okay. <laughs> Are you getting any traction? Canada. Well, we're having this meeting. I would call this traction. You know, from my perspective, this is a big step forward. Today's my first day in Canada. I've never been here before, you know, and, and uh, I'm up here and able to talk with you all. And this is probably more people than we had at our first Thorium conference. So from my perspective, things are going great. You know, everything. We're, we're on an uphill tack here. The fact that we have an internet today is going to ultimately make the difference because I think hundreds of years from now, this will be called the beginning of the thorium age. You know, we had Bronze Age and we had Iron Age and we had the Industrial Revolution. I really think hundreds of years from now they'll say there was a thorium age that began. Every time mankind has been able to access a new source of energy, it has led to profound societal implications. You know, the Industrial Revolution and the ability to use chemical fuels was what finally did in slavery. Human beings have had slaves for thousands and thousands of years. And when we learned how to make carbon our slave instead of other human beings, we started to learn how to be able to be civilized people and how to use machines to do what we need to do instead of make other people do it. I really believe that if we don't have access to affordable and clean energy, we will revert. We will go back to the way humans have been for thousands and thousands of years, which is where the powerful and the rich oppress the masses who live terrible lives trying to provide things for just a few people. We live much better lives today because we have learned how to use carbon. Okay, what about thorium? Thorium has a million times the energy density of a carbon-hydrogen bond. What could that mean for human civilization going out thousands, tens of thousands of years into the future? Because we're not gonna run out of this stuff. Once we've learned how to use it at this kind of efficiency, we will never run out. It is simply too common. 
I think it'll happen. It may take my entire lifetime. You know, it may be, Einstein was, I mean, not Einstein, trust me, but Einstein was one asked what it would take for other physicists to accept the theory of relativity. And he responded, well, the old people will have to die first. And then uh, the young people who got used to it will come along and they'll accept it, which he's pretty much right. This is laws of physics stuff. I didn't invent it. All I do is promote it. Maybe I'll never see it happen in my life, but somebody will do it. Once people have learned how to do it, they'll keep using it because it will make that much difference to the uh, ultimate destiny of humanity. And which takes me back to a question one of you answered that I did not answer, which says, why do people say that nuclear energy is not green, that we don't have enough of it? And it's because if you look at the way we're doing nuclear energy now, just burn up that very, very small amount of uranium-235, that is not sustainable. If we tried to run the entire planet based only on the incredibly poor uh, energy consumption we get now, we would not be able to use conventional nuclear energy for hundreds of years. We would run out of fissile uranium-235. Uranium's not that uncommon, but uranium-235 is almost as rare as gold. I mean, imagine if we were burning gold for energy. You know, we don't want to do that. And what Weinberg and Wigner and other guys figured out is don't burn the U-235. Use it like a seed. Use it like a catalyst and burn cheap stuff like uranium-238 or thorium. That's how you make civilization run for thousands and thousands of years. But that's not what we're doing. So if I was uh, uh, somebody who was anti-nuclear and I was looking at this and saying, yeah, you can't run the world on, on nuclear energy because you're going to run out of uranium because the way you're doing it now, and, you know, frankly, they'd be right. You, know, you might argue about when that point will come, but it will come. But if you get off of that stage, if you get closer to that 100% fuel efficiency, especially with thorium, which is three times more common than uranium, then the whole story changes. And now it is sustainable, and it can be very, very green. Yes, sir. I have my impression of what you've said, and just to sum up directly, the major concerns that people have with the way nuclear is now is the unsustainable mining of uranium the, the huge water demand and the high pressure and the, the chance of something going wrong and the loss of volatile substances in the atmosphere. Um, would you say those are the main three? I think you had the, the big point. And I think the people at the have a problem with a lot of the byproducts and volatility dangerous. Well, and yeah, the loss of volatility in the air, because if, if it stays in a can, then you, you have it all contained. And you put it somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's when it gets out that it's a problem. So this, would you say that this addresses all three of those? Well, yeah, and, but let, let me zoom in just a little bit more on volatiles. I mean, the two most volatile things in spent nuclear fuel are the two noble gases, xenon and krypton. In any nuclear process, including what we do today, xenon will decay to a stable. All of the radio, radioactive isotopes of xenon decay relatively quickly. So if you were to take spent nuclear fuel and release all its volatiles, the xenon and krypton, okay, if you release xenon and krypton from spent nuclear fuel, it would not really pose any danger, even the way we do it today. So what I think you were... You may, you may have intended, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so correct me if I'm wrong, is you're talking about the, uh, the emission of things like plutonium, which isn't volatile, but it is uh, a transuranic that is, that is uh, a subject of concern. Is, is that? How is iodine getting from Japan to North America? It's blowing in the wind. You know, iodine 131, which we're hearing a lot about in the news today, is extremely valuable if you can recover it in a reactor because it's actually used for thyroid therapy. People take iodine-131 on purpose to go to their thyroid and irradiate it in order to destroy tumors. So uh, iodine-131 is a particularly valuable medical radioisotope. We don't want to go and release it to the general population, but if you can produce it and get it to the right people, it can save lives, and in fact does every day. I can't remember who the uh, ancient physician was, but there was an ancient physician who said that all poison is about the dose. You know, that basically everything in the wrong amounts is deadly. I'm just curious, it seems to me you have a pretty good opportunity now. We've got the disaster in Japan, you've got the Middle East situation, you've got a bomb policy, energy policy, and you've got water issues in the United States, and everybody's looking for alternative energy sources. Have you seen any more interest in this? Oh, interest has skyrocketed since... Uh, I mean, the interest was already on its way up, and it really, really went up since uh, March 11th. You know, we're getting a lot more media coverage now. I'm getting several media opportunities a day that's probably going to die off, just like a half-life. But uh, 
I've, I've had a lot of chances to, to talk to people and a lot of articles be written. It is a challenge to get people with resources, though, to commit to making this happen. It's always a challenge to do that because uh, I don't have a lot of money, but I know some people who do, and they always have a really basic question. If you ask them for their money, they say, okay, how am I going to get it back, and how much more am I going to get back than I gave you? And how long is it going to take you to give it back to me? You know, and so if you give them the right answers to those questions and they believe you, they generally would give you their money. If you uh, say, you know, I don't really know. This is really important for the future of humanity and we really ought to do it. They generally go, that's wonderful. Feel free to talk to somebody else. I want to build a reactor to, uh, um, to create energy, uh, energy for oil sands. Uh -huh. This would be the perfect opportunity to go talk to you. Well, if we have a reactor like this, do we need the oil sands? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the way I look at it. I don't know a lot about oil sands, but I know that it's a particularly hard way to get oil. And uh, I know that people in the Middle East can get oil a whole lot cheaper from their place than people can get it from the oil sands. Well, if I can beat them by a million to one, maybe we ought to do that. Well, I'd like to thank our speaker today. We have a, a Mount Royal. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. longer Kirk has before he has to go to his evening engagement, but he may be around for a couple more minutes if you have individual questions. Um, yeah, I saw your video last week and then I decided to come here. Okay. Could something like this be compact enough to be like on a jet or something? Like that? Well, originally they invented this trying to look at how they put on aircraft. And the short answer came out to be probably not. But the thing that was cool though was it was such a hard challenge was that it really pushed this technology in another direction. And I think if they hadn't had such an incredibly hard challenge, they wouldn't have invented this in the first place. So I don't think we're gonna see this on a jet, but what it can do is we could go and make fuel for jet aircraft or from cars. I mean, with this kind of energy, you can take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and hydrogen from the water and you can make hydrocarbons, potentially even cheaper than digging them out of the oil sands. You know, so if we could make fuels, that way, basically you could make carbon neutral gasoline, you know. We wouldn't have to feel guilty about going filling up our cars if we knew it was all carbon neutral, right? You're just reversing the combustion process. Excellent. What are you doing in uh, launch systems, space launch systems? I had to set it down. I was very, very interested in it. Worked in that for a while at NASA, doing uh, working on Ares 1 and some other rockets. But uh, since going over to Teledyne, I've kind of set my whole aerospace career aside and focusing on the nuclear now. And I feel like this is really important, you know? And rockets, rockets will wait. I can come back to rockets again someday. <laughs> we need to work on the energy crisis right now. Yeah. Excellent. So, Just an great. aside from the salt or molten salt yeah. reactors, Chernobyl. Chernobyl, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's still in fission, correct? No, no, no. Chernobyl. All, all, fission stopped immediately at Chernobyl. So how come it's, it's enclosed, right, to block yeah. the radiation? Uh, well, number one, there was a steam explosion at Chernobyl, and when all that water left the reactor, that was what stopped the fission. But that decay heat is still there. They went, they went ahead and they buried Chernobyl in concrete. One of the problems with doing that, and I'm hearing them talking about doing that at Fukushima Daiichi, and I don't think it's a really good idea, is because concrete's not a real good conductor of heat. You know, so this stuff is decay heating for a long time. They have it cooled underneath, though, too. Oh, they do? Okay. I would generally say if you want to go and tomb something, make sure you're able to remove heat for a long time. Burying in concrete, it's like, sticking my note, it's like sticking my laptop on underneath the pillow. You know, I pick it up and it's like burning hot because heat isn't being removed as fast as it's being put in. Yeah, Chernobyl was a, was a crazy design. You know, it had never been built in the West in the first place. And they were running in a crazy way and they had that terrible explosion and the core just burned for days. I mean, just, just a mess. Um, situation in Japan, completely different. Nothing I just don't like about the way the media is addressing this. You know, Chernobyl and Fukushima Daiichi really have nothing in common. Fukushima Daiichi was taken to a state that it was not ever designed to go. It was always meant to have coolant. The safest thing of all was, would have probably been to keep running the reactor. Yeah, which After would have made Earth sense, form. yeah. Because the reactor survived the quake, and the quake was 50 times more powerful than what they'd been designed to survive. If they'd have just kept running it, they'd have had the power, because power was the whole problem. You know? So they said the sarcophagus surrounding that they've enclosed it in or entombed it in, yeah. it was only good for 30 years, so the 30 years is coming up. Uh -huh. <laughs> So do they just enclose it again in more concrete? Boy, I don't know. I, I, uh, every time I learn anything about Chernobyl, I just keep learning what an incredibly 
bad idea. The thing was in the first place. I mean, everything about it was a bad idea. The design was a bad idea. The operation was a bad idea. The way they addressed it afterwards was a bad idea. It's just like, it's it's a nightmare. And we're coming up on 25 years after it happened. But but even with that, one thing uh, about Chernobyl is it really was the worst case scenario. And yet, Chernobyl, the area around it uh, from a, a environmental perspective is flourishing. The radiation levels in Chernobyl are significantly less than what you would get right here in, in Calgary. And that's because even though there's a lot more radiation coming off the reactor, it was in a naturally low background radiation area, about 200 millirems, about 50 millirems from the reactor, so you get 250. You're probably getting six, 700 millirems living here in Calgary, naturally. Well, you're higher. There's less atmosphere between you and cosmic rays. There's a lot of granite in the rock. So there's a lot of uranium and thorium. I w another article I read, this was, this was interesting, they said you'd get more radiation on a uh, flight than you would getting around, walking around the grounds of Fukushima Daiichi right now. I thought, wow, I'm on a flight right now and I'm getting, there's a lot less atmosphere between me and the universe and I'm getting a lot more cosmic ray radiation, you know? So it, it's really hard. I, I don't mean to diminish the risks of Chernobyl or Fukushima Daiichi at all, but we have to remember we live in a radioactive world, you know, and it's all about the dose. Your body has repair mechanisms against radioactivity and against radiation damage. If it didn't, you'd die every time you went in the sun because the sun is by far and away doing, when you get a sunburn, a sunburn is radiation damage. That's radiation burn is what, it, we don't call it that, but that's what it is. Your body is responding, trying to prevent further uh, radiation damage, ionizing radiation to your skin and your cells. And it's generating melanin, which is a natural shielding mechanism. So we have to remember our bodies do have the ability to fight this if it is, if you get it in doses that don't exceed its ability to fight. You don't want to let anybody get too much radiation dose at any one time versus a longer or more chronic exposure. But we live in a radioactive world. There's nothing that's going to change that. And, and the radioactivity that we get from nuclear reactors is extremely small in comparison to the radioactivity we're getting from, from other sources. So biggest one being radon. You know, there's a radioactive gas that's coming out of the ground all the time. And you're breathing it right now. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it, you know. And it is responsible by far for the majority of the radioactivity that your body receives, you know. It's just the planet we live on. Yeah. Kirk, you mentioned how uh, the uh, reaction uh, speed varies adversely with temperature. Does this uh, provide any prospect of having uh, uh, reactors that could be throttled? Yes. In fact, that's the original purpose of the reactor was to power an airplane. And one of the things they wanted was they didn't want a reactor that um, took 15 guys in the back trying to run it. They wanted one where the pilot could sit in the cockpit, go mm, like that to the engines, and the reactor would respond. And that's literally what this would do. The pilot could command the engines to go to higher power, and they would start removing more heat from the coolant flow, and that in turn would cause the reactor to increase its power output. And just the opposite would happen when you reduce the power to the engines. So it was a self-controlling reactor, and it could be throttled, and you could go up and down in power levels. So right now we run our reactors essentially at base load. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of the big ones has to do with Xenon 135, and I can't get into that right now. But uh, this doesn't have either the Xenon problem or the throttling problem. So we could run this in a load-following way where it would respond naturally to the way we consume energy, which is different in the morning, the afternoon, the evening. We all go to bed, and you know, power demand really plummets. So yeah, this could very much be a, a throttleable reactor. Any idea what the time constant would be like? Or? It's very responsive, mainly because you've removed uh, xenon-135, which is a noble gas that is very, very absorptive of neutrons. In a normal solid fuel reactor, that gas can't get out of the solid fuel, and it causes a delay and a lag in the response of the reactor. It's extremely complicated. It's devilish, and it's one of the reasons why when you've got a reactor power, you want to hold it at power. Because as you try to change the setting, uh, it gets tougher. Now, I have some Navy friends, and they say, oh, we take reactors up and down all the time on submarines. And I say, yeah, but you have a few extra tricks that most reactors don't have in order to do that. They have a lot of extra ability to uh, introduce called reactivity into the core. They can override things. And we don't build civilian reactors the way they build them in the Navy. And there's good reasons why. But So that's why it's, uh, it would be very responsive, the ability to remove that xenon. So, have you got all these people excited now? I hope so. Is everybody excited? Let's go do it, man. Come on. <laughs> so, I mean, if people want to support this, obviously, you know, as students, we're not just going to go out and get a whole bunch of money and give you the money. And well, that, that would be cool. Yeah. You know, I mean, can we do that? <laughs> what can, what do you want, what, what can we do? How can we get involved? Write me an email. Don't feel bad if I don't write you back for a few months, but I probably will. Uh, 
I have to be a little bit cryptic right now. <laughs> in the meantime, uh, one thing you could do is you could go to, if you're on Facebook, you can go to Energy from Thorium and you can like the page. You know, that's one thing. And then you get an online community that's talking about it. Um, you could uh, become a member of the Thorium Energy Alliance. You know, I think they have pretty reasonable student rates. If anything, it might even be free. Uh, you can come to one of the conferences. Talk to your friends about it. Tell people about it. I mean, the biggest problem we have is getting the message out. A, a guy got on yesterday and he said, you know, why don't we go buy a, a full page ad? And I said, because that costs a lot of money. Why don't you just go tell five of your friends about it? It doesn't cost you anything. And it's probably a whole lot more effective than getting an ad in the newspaper. You mentioned nuclear. Yeah. To anyone in their initial reaction is to be like, oh, well, I want to see how, you know, how good this could help the world. It's like, is this dangerous? Or, yeah. is, it, is, this dangerous? or is it really complicated? Because I'm in that class, yeah. the, the uh, um, science and politics of nuclear energy. Huh. And I mean, I think a lot of people were daunted by nuclear energy. Oh, this is, there's no way we could learn this stuff. It's, I don't want to do that class. It's going to be too hard. Huh. So that might be another, another barrier to people you yeah. know, learning about it. Maybe people sometimes say, is nuclear energy safe? And the first thing I say is, well, which one? <laughs> There's thousands of different ways to do nuclear energy. Is the car safe? Well, which one? You know, or how are you going to drive it and how are you going to operate it? So uh, we have great conversation starters now because lots of regular people are talking about nuclear energy. Most, unfortunately, got a lot of fear, but it's an excuse to talk about things like, oh, what is radioactivity? Well, let me tell you about it in terms of iodine. You know, they're talking about iodine in the news. What does that mean? What does it mean to have an eight-day half-life? Well, it means in eight days, there'll be half as much of it as it was eight days before. And eight days later, there'll be half as much as that. It's going away. And we do the math, in about a month, it's gone. OK, wow, I didn't know that. And you know stuff like that. Well, can nuclear power be safe? Well, let me tell you what happened over here and what went wrong. Uh, in a lot of ways, this was an amazing thing. This thing survived this incredible earthquake. It was just, it got smacked by this wave. And that's what took it out of a region. It was, if we had power to the plant, there wouldn't have ever been a meltdown or any of these things. It would have removed heat just fine. If it had been the tsunami without the earthquake, yeah. there wouldn't have been a problem. It was the, the earthquake shutting it down, then a tsunami knocking off the electricity and the generators at the same time. Yeah. So ironically, if there had been a tsunami but no earthquake, we might be better. But we don't get tsunamis better. No, I don't. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if, to me, the message is design a reactor that does not need uh, emergency power. You know, and that's tough to do with solid fuel and water coolant. I mean, you can do it, but it's tough. With this, it's a whole lot less tough. And uh, that's a pretty compelling argument. You know, I, I gave a presentation a couple weeks ago. All we talked about was safety. You know, I didn't tell them anything else about Lifter. I didn't tell them about Thorium or anything. I said, here's how it is when things go wrong. Here's the safety. Here's the comeback. And that was all people wanted to hear about, and I didn't blame them. So there's a great chance for conversation starters right now and take advantage of it, talk to people about it. Because I really, I used to think, uh, when I was y'all's age, um, I was an aerospace engineer, I didn't know anything about nuclear. I thought nuclear power was dumb. I had no interest in it. You know, I was like, oh, old junk. Who would want to be into that? It wasn't until I learned about thorium and I realized these efficiencies were possible that I began getting really interested. Um, I can't, I don't know about you, I can't get really excited about half a percent efficient, you know? That just seems like a big waste of stuff to me. I mean, as a marketing student, I have a lot different approach, but I can still get excited. <laughs> hey, about. you know what? We need guys just like you. Any other marketing students here? I mean, this, you know, there, there's, there's almost a branding effort that needs to happen. How do you tell a story saying this is different? You know, don't do new Coke, but what do you do? You know, how do you help people understand that there really are alternative possibilities out there? We need guys like you thinking about this. Well, it'd be like a dream job because you know, be a marketer and help people. We definitely need to talk. <laughs> Give it a cool name. Give it a cool name. Yeah. Superhero. Superhero, like, oh, like Thor? Oh wait, there's a movie for that, right? You know? So how do you passively cool the drain tank? Natural circulation of air. That would probably be the best way to do it. And then make sure the air ducts aren't blocked. That is something I've wondered about, is how do you deal with a situation where, uh, where you might get a blockage of air ducts? That would be the most credible scenario. So then I've also thought about having additional, you know, uh, tanks of water. One of the problems with the solid fuel is it just can't tolerate being heated very much before it begins to fail. This liquid fuel will go to like 1500 degrees and the hotter things get the more effectively they transfer heat. Okay so if you can if you get something hot enough it'll just dump heat even it'll dump heat to rock if it gets hot enough. So having a, a substance that's stable for that long and, and that thermally conductive is a really good thing. So you're burying this uh, drainage tank underground or something? Mm -hmm. You're not going to have, if you don't have any electricity, you're not going to have any flow. You can't uh, make any liquid flow or the air flow. So if you're leaving it one spot, it's continuously 
putting this heat out. I have a radical notion that I've espoused for a number of years, and a lot of my friends, even in this area, don't like it. I think we should be building these on submarines, and we should have them underwater. And the reason I think that is, if you were underwater, you would be completely impervious to earthquakes and tsunamis and airplane strikes and a whole bunch of other things that can go wrong. You go 100 meters underwater, that's an environment that just doesn't change. And I'm not saying put it on the seafloor, but just keep it underwater. And then you're surrounded by a fantastic cooling medium that essentially has unlimited ability to absorb heat. Uh, it's also mobile. You can take it to where you need to go. Most uh, people in the world live within 100 miles of a coastline. And then people say, oh, you can't put a nuclear reactor on a submarine. I said, okay, let's count how many nuclear reactors are on submarines today versus how many are on the ground. Because people don't want to see a power plant. They don't want to see any power plant. They don't want to see nuclear. They don't want to see coal. They don't want to see oil. They don't want to see solar. They don't want to see wind. They want power to be invisible. How do you build an invisible power plant? Was it Weinberg? Weinberg. Weinberg? Mm -hmm. Yeah. His uh, superior said, you're on a quadrillion, billion, million dollar idea here, or like you're working on one right now, and to switch over from the fuels like oil and gas and like uranium, do you find that possible? The safety issue is these companies not liking that? And Every era of human history has been marked by new ideas that lead to revolutionary thoughts, that lead to radical change that sometimes doesn't go too well. I see no reason to think our era will be any different. So uh, the best we can do is try to hopefully manage that as civilized human beings. But yeah, you know, uh, fossil fuels make a lot of money right now. Would you feel, uh, do you feel concerned for your safety if you were to push through and... I'm more concerned about the safety of uh, my children's future if I don't do it. Right. And your children's future. And our grandchildren's future. You know, so what? I mean, something happens, something happens. Something's going to happen. So um, why don't we press forward, try to build the best world we can. I'm a lot more worried about someday looking at our descendants and trying to have them say, why did you give us this world that we have now? Why did you give us this world of energy poverty, of pollution, of war, of disease, when you knew there was a better way and you could have made it happen? You know, why didn't you do it? I mean, that's the same question we'd ask these guys that we could go back to 1969, right? You say, why didn't you do this? You knew about it and you could have made it happen, but you didn't. What's your excuse? You know, we wouldn't be very forgiving. History is not particularly forgiving of those who passed up remarkable opportunities. And uh, I, think that, I think that we have to do this or we're going to continue to have wars based on trying to get ever and ever more scarce fossil fuel resources. Is there a possibility to um, go to some poor country, say Haiti, build one and leave it there, don't tell anyone about it, <laughs> let it work, and then say, look guys, we built one, it works. That is a possibility. Um, that takes money. It still takes money, and I don't think Haiti has very much of it. Um, I don't know. You know, it, the, the, this may be initially demonstrated in some place that doesn't have a lot of money, but has a lot of need. Tonga, for instance, a small island in the South Pacific. The King of Tonga last June got in front of his parliament and he said, I would like to host an advanced nuclear reactor demonstration. The parliament literally laughed him out of the room. You know, this is a very small island, a small country, but it's a sovereign country. Now, I'm sure he wasn't under any illusions that he himself could finance that effort, but what he was saying was, we would be happy to, to uh, have a home for this. I think that's the kind of thing, why don't we go and look into that, see if we take them up on it. Would you be interested? Because a lot of these small island countries are paying absurd prices for electricity because they're basing it all on imported diesel. You can't grow an economy if you're paying 50 cents to a dollar per kilowatt hour for electricity. I mean, you just, you can't afford to do anything. You can't afford to have the lights on at those kind of costs. If you want to grow your economy, you have to have access to affordable and inexpensive energy. And so I think there might be places uh, Japan is like a really big version of this, you know. Japan imports almost all of its energy, and that's why they're interested in nuclear. But maybe there are smaller examples, places get started, maybe Haiti, yeah. some place in the Caribbean. Uh, it's tough to do in places that already have cheap energy, you know. If you're in a country that has lots of oil, lots of gas, they might not be so keen on something else.
One of the things that makes the conventional reactor so expensive are two things. One is the containment vessel, and, and you've touched on that. The other is all the security apparatus around the maintaining of the fissile material so it doesn't get diverted for military purposes. Now, given that you can use weapons you know, using highly enriched uranium or you can use plutonium, can you use thorium? Thorium itself. It, it, under the same principle as using uranium. I've scratched my head about that with existing reactors because our reactors, at least in the United States, don't use highly enriched uranium. And the plutonium is inside. Well, that's one of the, the fears and that's one of the security reasons around it. Whether it's real or not. It's, it's well, yeah, I guess I would have to challenge whether it's real or not. I mean, even the plutonium inside the reactors is what's called reactor grade plutonium, which well, isn't I suitable. Try going, you know, uh, <coughs> you try going to any facility in North America now. I mean, there's SWAT I mean, teams. I, and I've, <laughs> I've toured a nuclear power plant. Yeah, we really, we really got the working over. We went in there. But um, I'm not exactly sure what the basis of that was, where they were worried about theft of fissile material. That'd be pretty hard. I'd have to go and depressurize the core, take the lid off, get access to all the spent fuel handling materials, remove it, somehow remove it from the spent fuel pool into some type of transport cask, take it off the site to a reprocessing facility that doesn't exist. I mean, I just go, there's got to be another reason they have all that security, because that scenario is just so nonsensical that I just, I watch, just. Watch the TV news. Well, you know, I, I, that's why I, I kind of don't put a lot of faith in it just seems to me when there's a subject I know a little bit about and I watch how the news covers it, I get frustrated really quickly. <laughs> it's the cost issue of building the reactor. It's not the fuel cost. That's, yeah, that's fuel the cost is not significant. So how is the uh, a molten salt reactor going to be different from a cost basis, not from a fuel basis? Well, I guess I would, I would assume that the, uh, the real cost of the, of the reactor um, has to do a lot more with the regulation. I guess I, I, I'm not, I, I don't want to say I disagree, disagree is too strong a word. I, I might weight my emphases slightly differently. You know, you're weighting containment and security. I might reduce the weight on that, put a little more weight on okay. cost of regulation, regulation, materials, red tape, yeah. you know, uh, and, and to say, you know, maybe the overall integrated effect is more like this distribution rather than this distribution. That's why we have a three-year environmental assessment process in Canada to build a nuclear reactor and we have a weekend to produce a coal. Coal and gas plants are able to release radioactive materials to the environment in much greater amounts than a nuclear plant would ever possibly be allowed to because they are considered uh, what's called NORM, naturally occurring radioactive materials. For instance, when you go frack a shale and you pull gas out, a lot of radon comes out with that too. You burn the gas, that radon's being released. Nobody counts that radon against the gas. If they did, <laughs> the regulatory commission would shut the gas, gas plant down. Same with coal. Coal contains small amounts of uranium and thorium. They go up the stack, they're dispersed. Why they can't tell you how much waste they produce. Yeah, and, and, and so yeah. if, and they've spent a lot of money to make sure that regulatory agencies do not regulate NORM uh, for a, gold, a coal or a gas plant the way they regulate radioactive emissions from a nuclear plant. If they did, we would be shutting down all our coal and gas plants based on radioactivity alone. So, uh, you know, are, are, the, are the rules being applied fairly? Probably not, you know. <laughs> but thank you, thank you all for having me. I like my mug. This could be great, man. That's a great mug. But not a billion dollars. And a cup. Oh, my, and a pen. All right, a pen for my mug. A cup and a pen. A cup and a pen. I got to come back to Canada.